Hi, and welcome everybody. My name is Ken Annandale. I'm the CEO of a company called IntraSafe. We're publishers of occupational health and safety training material, and this is one of our many affiliate licensee orientation sessions. We do this as a deliberate program so that we can provide our licensees, our affiliates, and our training material users with insights into aspects relating to occupational health and safety. What we've been doing recently is we've been taking the, we took the topic of COVID and we webinared it almost to death. We had numerous webinars on it, then the effects of COVID and then the psychological aspects and we've had guest speakers. And then as a result of the fact that we are constantly talking COVID, 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 I felt challenged to get back to our actual discipline and our discipline is occupational health and safety. So while we're focusing on COVID and we know that it's absolutely critical that we focus on it and we continue with the process, especially now that we're hearing of second waves and things like that, let's not forget that occupational health and safety is what we are all about. That's our background, that's our speciality, it's our, for many of us, it's a passion and it's been a lifelong cause for us. So I decided to start looking at the aspect of occupational health. Most of us are familiar with the occupational safety side. Um, many of us have done Nibosh or Samtrack, we've done uh, courses at various universities or colleges and so forth. And the focus is safety, 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 safety. And yet the World Health Organization tells us that something like 80% of all workplace deaths are in fact as a result of occupational diseases, workplace diseases and illnesses, many of which only manifest years after the person has even retired. So I decided let's look at this last week or the week before last, uh, we had a speaker, Wayne was on and he spoke about asbestos. That video is available and you can, if you want, you can watch it, just let us know and we'll send you the YouTube um, URL and you can watch that video. I found it particularly informative. Tonight we have a special speaker and we're going to be tackling another topic. Our following speaker, which I advertised and I said in two weeks time, we're going to have a speaker speaking about dust, can unfortunately not make it. So I'm just waiting for a speaker to speak to us and we'll probably be speaking not so much about occupational health on this occasion, but more on the environmental thing. We talk about she, safety, health, environment, and we have a speaker who has been one of our meeting. Uh, uh, she has attended numerous meetings and we've asked Ilsa if she can actually assist us and do a talk on that. Okay, so having said that, we've, we're just allowing a couple of additional people in. I'm going to go on to screen share in a moment so that we can make sure that everybody's with us and see what we're doing. So stand by, just give me a second here. There we go. Okay, and I can see myself in the corner here. There we are. So what we're going to be doing this evening is that we're going to be looking at and visiting the subject of workplace ergonomics. Some of you know, or may not know, that in December of last year, an ergonomic regulation was promulgated. It came out with a flurry, but then it was almost um, swamped by COVID-19. Before we could actually get off the ground and make things happen, we found that COVID-19 became the topic of the day. So what we've done is we've decided to go back and have a look at the ergonomics, um, the aspect, the, the discipline, the information, the sciences, and we've invited a speaker who would assist us with this specific uh, topic. Before we get into that, I'd like to ask you to kindly please um, register. I just want to see, put my camera there. Just register via WhatsApp. If you wouldn't mind sending me a message via WhatsApp, just to say that you are here. There's a very good reason that we want to do that. We would like to ask you to send us your details so that we can send you a certificate of attendance. Well, maybe not by name and not by ID number, but just to say that you are here because as of today, all our webinars will now have SIOSH CPD points. This specific webinar will give you one CPD point, which you can claim from SIOSH as part of your professional standing and status and maintaining that status. So please send me your details. I'll repeat this a couple of times so that you can actually let us know that you are here and if you want your CPD points, you can do that. A little bit of information about us before we get into it. We have a program which we call the affiliate system or the affiliate program. And there are three basic levels to this program, the affiliate basic, the affiliate prime, and the affiliate corporate. Now the basic is for service providers who want to run health and safety training programs. The prime is for those service providers who want to be CETA accredited and include CETA accreditation together with a number of other benefits as well. And then of course, we've got the corporate program and the corporate program is specifically for the multinationals, the universities and places like that. 
So there's a little bit of information as to what we do. There's a ton of information on our website and you'll be able to get it. Now, if you would like, you can go onto the website and you can actually get more information and a proposal and all the information in writing from the website. But before we talk too much about that, let me just repeat. Those of you that are members of SIOSH, the South African Institute of Occupational Health and Safety, you're more than welcome to claim your CPD points as a result of attending this session. To do that, you need to send me a WhatsApp on that WhatsApp number 082-920-8912, 920 -8912, and we will send you a verification saying that you participated in this entire process. Okay, so once again, we'd like to say welcome to all the people that are coming in. We appreciate that. And at this stage, what I want to do is I want to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is the Chief Executive Officer of Ergomax. And Ergomax is one of South Africa's leading, if not the leading ergonomics consultancy. He has a master's degree in ergonomics from Rhodes University. He is um, subject of, of well, subjects that he studied and passion relates to ergonomics, biomechanics, anatomy, physiology, and psychology. He's also, we can see from the, the image over there, a triathlete, and he was just telling me a couple of minutes ago about a race that's going to be coming up, a mountain bike race, which he's going to be participating in. So let me tell you a little bit about Ergomax. It's the leading ergonomics uh, consultancy in Africa. With over 17 years in practice, Dale is South Africa's first certified professional ergonomist. He's involved in consultation, creation of risk calculators, and ergonomics training. He'll be talking about one of his training programs, I trust, and we're going to be inviting our affiliates to attend that training program as and when the opportunity arises. Dale has served on various committees, developing guidelines for work-related upper limb disorders, <coughs> excuse me, and components of the ergonomics regulation. So with that, I believe it's time for me to hand over to him. So allow me just to set it up so that we can get Dale on as our primary host. And Dale, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So here we go. Going to make you the host and over to you, Dale. Thank you, uh, Ken, for that uh, very kind um, introduction. Um, just while we're doing this, I've just admitted someone. So let me just... Do this quickly. I trust you can all see the screen. Um, I certainly can. All right. And then, Ken, I'm going to now give you back the host, but just make sure that that little green arrow sits by my name. So that means I'm still in control of my screen. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right. So, uh, first of all, thank you. I'm actually very honored that 30 of you have taken the time to log online to listen to me uh, chatting. Um, thank you very much, Ken, for the kind introduction. Um, yes, I am one of the first. Uh, I think there's a lot of more cleverer or more intelligent people out there than me. But at the end of the day, um, you know, this is what I love. This is my passion. Um, I, I live for making ergonomics as easy as possible. And I will go through the fundamental concepts of, of what we mean by ergonomics, um, hopefully dispel some of your insecurities we have with the subject matter of ergonomics, um, because at the moment, you know, with the regulation coming out, particularly in South Africa, you know, people aren't too sure where it fits into the whole greater, the bigger picture of occupational health and safety. Um, the purest ergonomists would like to say that they supersede everything, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't think he's a bit, a bit arrogant on their behalf. Um, but I don't believe that is the case at all. Um, I think we are a component of occupational health and safety, and I will unpack that uh, later with you. But hopefully what I can do is dispel some, uh, like I said, some of, some of the misguided interpretations. I did sit on the committee drawing up the regulation, so I have got um, quite a good knowledge of, of, of what we were meaning by when we wrote it. Um, other than, you know, being a, per, in a, a private consultant and then working for government drawing up the regulation, it is, for those of you that want to pull it apart and criticize it, which I don't mind, I think criticism is good for you, it is very difficult to appease every profession um, you know, a lot of the comments we got with that regulation development was more to protect their profession than actually wanting to um, bolster occupational health and safety overall. So um, it was difficult. Um, and the other concept we must understand, um, and I think why people battle with ergonomics is 
it touches everywhere, you know, um, from there's a little bit of ergonomics in hygiene. There's a little bit of ergonomics in physiotherapy. There's a, a, a lot of ergonomics in occupational therapy. Um, there's ergonomics in health and safety. So people are just not too sure who ne- is responsible for it sometimes. And um, we even as a consultancy, you know, sometimes have to deal with the hygiene department of a company. Then it's the safety department. Then it's human resource department. So we also get um, a bit tossed around as to, there is no dedicated department within the company that is actually the custodians of ergonomics. So hopefully that will change um, the more we do exercises like this and obviously the more we create awareness. Um, so, you know, just in a nutshell, er- ergonomics tends to be quite, um, as I was discussing now, whoopsie, sorry, I um, jumped there, a, a bit abused in industry, all right? Um, and I think it's more to do with the marketers out there that are saying, well, let's just chuck the word ergonomics onto our product and we can charge more, more for it. And therefore um, it will be a better product and the, and the public won't be the wiser. And, um, you know, and unfortunately I think they, they got hit the nail on the head there. We will tend to believe what is told and what is sold to us, um, you know, and, and there are many cases out there that, that, you know, just because something's labeled ergonomics doesn't mean it's a good product for you. You know, and, and, and we hear this over and over again. People say, I've got such a bad back, my back sore, but I'll be fine because I'm going to go buy an ergonomics chair. And I'm like, if you're a bad driver and you go buy a new car, it's not going to make you a better driver. <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to be the same driver. <laughs> you know, the car might just look a bit fancier. So um, it is widely abused. Um, it is often misunderstood. And, and as a result, just underutilized. All right. Um, it, it is also, you know, a lot of my, my father's a CA and I think it took me all of 15 years to try to actually explain exactly what his son actually does in the world. And, um, and because it is difficult to measure the benefits, you know, and typically companies are not really interested in how we reduced our safety. You know, they're more interested in how much has our safety cost us and have we made money this year? You know, now, I mean, it's a quite a poor generalization, but Ultimately, if, if, if your company is not making money, there is no company. So, and I understand that. Um, and we've just got to get creative, I think, in, in, in not only in ergonomics, in all health and safety spheres of, of actually justifying what we want to do in companies from a financial perspective and not from a health and safety perspective. So that's often what I, I say to my clients is don't tell your boss that we need to get a, a scale so we can weigh our employees to offset um, the dangers of, of, of overweight employees. Tell them what it's costing the company when the guy's off going to hospital to get his blood sugar medication every second week and stuff and say, well, this is what we lose in, in terms of actual productivity from this employee. This is what his salary costs. And he's gone for two hours every second week. So it's actually costing us X amount of rands every, every month. So, And that's something I've had to learn in my now 20 years actually um, of of working is, is I can't justify things from ergonomics or from health and safety because I'm not, those people that we are talking to are not trained in health and safety and ergonomics. So just to try and unpack a complicated definition, this is the International Ergonomics Association's definition. Um, It is also the definition used in the ergonomics regulation in South Africa. So for those of you that have never heard of it or are um, are concerned about what we mean by human factors or ergonomics, they are interchangeable. All right. Typically, um, sorry, typically in a, Ooh, I'm really, um, typically in, in, um, in human, in an ergonomics presentation um, there or in the ergonomics world is most of the world, uh, has the term ergonomics and America, lovely Americans at the moment, are, um, have the term human factors. Okay, so they are completely interchangeable. But if you are researching for ergonomics and you're looking for some, some like let's say data on um, vibration and stuff and how it relates to the human body, you can maybe just type in human factors and you can also find some research there. Okay, but um, if you read there, it, it is a scientific discipline. All right, and I bolded certain aspects because what we mean by scientific discipline is exactly like hygiene. Is we don't walk into a room and go, "Gosh, it sounds noisy." Yeah, they need to have hearing protection because it sounds noisy. We've actually got to physically measure the noise with a calibrated machinery, and and then obviously let the data talk. Now, unfortunately, with ergonomics, we don't have the rule book for um, the human body. You know, human body doesn't have a warning light like a car engine that says something's going on and fix it. 
Um, but we certainly can try and be as scientific as possible in terms of collecting data. So um, when it comes to, let's say, lifting a load, which everyone can relate to, you know, I can't lift a 50 bag, bag a kilogram bag of cement. It's quite hard for me, but someone else could. Okay. Now, do we score that as a high risk or low risk? So we actually collect data around what the person is doing. What's their posture? How, what are they reaching? Um, where, do they, where does the lift start from? Where do they take the, the load to? And all of that will put into the kitty and say, okay, look, it is a risk or not. Okay. So science means we collect data and let the data interpret for us and not our opinions. But what, what we're looking at is how that employee works within, the, within their system. Okay. And what we mean by that is, um, you know, Ken's wearing a set of glasses. All right. So what's affecting a, his system would be that there's a light shining in his glasses and it's reflecting back to us as the audience. So that stops us seeing the screen properly or for whatever reason, or it might interfere with um, Ken uh, uh, looking at the screen. So the system can be as small as the right type of glasses, the correct PPE. Uh, 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 safety glasses, prescription safety glasses, let's say, because if, if that tool doesn't work for you, then it is a poor system interaction and that's where the injuries happen. All right. So we take all this data and we look to optimize human well-being and the system performance. Okay. And I think a lot of people miss the system performance aspect of ergonomics. All right. We are there. Ultimately, ergonomics um, embedded in a company is going to help you make more money okay but it does it not by looking at the finances but optimizing human well-being okay so um that's what we're trying to do and what when we say optimize we cho they've chosen the words carefully we don't want maximum performance all right i don't want my employee working at a heart rate of 180 for an hour of the day because it means he's going to be so fatigued that for the rest of the day he won't be doing much all right so we will govern his heart rate, let's say to 110 beats per minute, and hopefully he can tolerate that. All right. So maximum is you train for four years, you run the Olympic, uh, Olympics, you run 100 meters in, in what's it loud, just on nine seconds. Optimum is our employee must take 20 minutes to do 100 meters. All right. Because then we know he's not been unduly stressed. It, it's meeting the, the, the productivity demands and the likelihood of injury is a bit, bit lowered. All right. So hopefully I'm, 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 I'm making myself a bit clear there. And um, I am happy for questions to be asked. Um, uh, if, if, if Kenny's happy to have the questions asked as we go, or let's just hold it till the end. It's um, either or it might be easier to hold till the end. Um, so the way I try and explain it in, in a nutshell is obviously we try and just, we go, we go extreme here. All right. So if you take this astronaut in space, all right. If you look at occupation, if the occupational health and safety boys and girls on this team and the hygienists on this team did not get everything 100% correct, this individual in that spacesuit would die. All right. Ergonomics doesn't worry about the health and safety. It doesn't worry about the hygiene because that's not our domain of speciality. What we want to know is what can that person do in that spacesuit? How long do we ask that person to work in that spacesuit? Has the health and safety guys considered all the health and safety issues? Have, have the hygiene guys considered all the hygiene variables? So we're not so, not so worried about the physical environment they're in. That's the hygienist job, the health and safety guys. We want to know what can that person actually do, all right? How long will they last for? How much food do they need? How much energy they're consuming? Are they overworked? Are they underworked? You know, um, I'll never forget um, the, the, the Canadian space um, commander, you know, went on a spacewalk and he forgot to wash his, um, the clean, some fluid that he put on his, in, on his face properly. And as he stepped out the, onto the spacewalk, his eyes started burning to the degree that he actually couldn't see. And all he could do was carry on blinking and hopefully the body's water will remove the stinging. But he nearly had to cancel that spacewalk because he couldn't touch his eyes because he forgot to do some minor um, issue there that affected the system performance. So that's what ergonomic looks at is to say, is this guy going to be able to do their job and how long can they do their job for? Obviously maximizing profit and ensuring they don't get injured. All right. So if we look at how complicated ergonomics gets, and I think this is where um, people do get concerned because they go, well, oh, it's so complicated. I don't know where to start. And I've always said, you know, 
you know, like I said, the, 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 the true, the, the purest ergonomist will try and make it as complicated as possible so that you cannot possibly do the work without them on, on your site. And I always say it can be as easy as possible or it can be as complicated as possible. And I think that's with most things in life. All right. And I'm all for the, the, the easy route. Okay. But as long as it is done correctly and obviously um, professionally, but if we look at your worker there, so this little guy's got to go to work. What are the things that we have to consider that can affect the system performance? Okay. So it's not as simple as, oh, well, let's match the man to the task and hopefully we'll make money. All right. Look at, I'll just talk through each block. So employee wellness. If that employee is too old, BMI is too high, they've been doing it for too long, or they've got some sort of congenital disorder, that's going to affect their ability to perform their work. Okay, but if they're a good employee, then the human behavior, what motivates that person to work? What, what roles are they in, in, in the company? What is the educational level? What is the cooperation at work that they experience? That also comes into play. The mental work demands, all right? And I'll, uh, the easiest thing to give you an example is, I've got a master's degree in ergonomics. Please don't ask me to go land an airplane, all right? That mental work demand will completely incapacitate me because I don't know what I'm doing. So what are the responsibilities you're giving? And I think a lot of companies miss that. They just assume, you know, and I always say it with, with, with an office environment, when you get a job, it is assumed you know how to work a computer. Okay, it's assumed that you're born typing. It's like typing seems to be a human skill like walking is. We're supposed to just develop it as we grow up. And that may not be the case, especially for the, the elder generation, the elderly generation, all right? Um, the physical environment. So if there's never been a hygiene assessment done, you know, that's going to affect the system performance. If, if, even if it's too dark, if it, you know, something that's too dark, people can't see color properly in, in, in dark. So if, if your, your system relies on you to, to weld an orange electrode um, to a green thing in a bob and not a red electrode to a green thing in a bob, then if the light's not right, you might weld the wrong or solder the wrong color to, to the thingy my bob, so to speak. So just the lighting can have a massive effect on the, on the, on the human body, all right? Again, I won't go too long. Workstation design plays a part, your, your physiology, what postures you hold in, what socioeconomic conditions you are faced with, um, and then obviously the working conditions, your wages, your working hours. And I mean, you know, one of those things are off it can affect that system performance. So ergonomics is trying to say, listen, we need to look at this holistically. We need to look at, at the bigger picture here. It's not about providing the correct safety boots and sending them on their way. So if there is a poor match, all right, between the demands of what we want our employees to do and the ability or their, let's say their, their, their capabilities, then there is a reduced likelihood of you achieving your business goals. All right, now remember I'm talking from an occupational health and safety perspective, not from a financial risk management uh, um, perspective. So when the person is being asked to do more than he can do or she can do, um, or there's something wrong with the working conditions or whatever the case may be, that we will call what I deem to be an unmanaged system. All right, and that's where you start getting your your health issues, uh, Ken mentioned your diseases. In South Africa, any ergonomic related injury in terms of the upper limb, the work related upper limb are classified as a disease. It's not an injury, okay? So if you've got a lot of absenteeism, a lot of injuries, a lot of long-term health issues with your company, um, uh, it's gonna create operational safety concerns that keep cropping up, your quality of your product is deteriorating, your cost of business is gonna go up, all right? And we've got, to, and it could, it, it could be any one of these factors that are in blue on the right hand side there. However, if you've got a better match, and you're never going to get a perfect match, but if you can try and sharpen your pencils where you can in this diagram, then you start realizing your business sustainability goals are, are, are a bit closer there. And that is your market share in the company. You know, you're increasing your profit, even just in these COVID times, trying to make some profit and, um, you know, grow your shareholder value, increase sales, just, just provide a job for people. All right. And, and the issue is, and, and I think historically, and I don't even think it's a South African thing, you know, people were seen as quite, quite expendable you know they can adapt i'm not changing my work environment we are the clever engineers we've designed this work environment the people must now know how to adapt and deal with the problems and if you complain well then you're soft 
Okay. And, and the thing is, yes, people, I think people are getting softer and, and, and are not prepared to work too hard, but there is that balance of, you know, outright abuse of employees. Uh, I think historically that has happened to more, okay, you know what, you know, these are, we invest in money in these people and we better sharpen our pencils in terms of, of keeping them as long as possible. And, um, you know, just as a caveat, what I, I saw on one of the news channels that the people suffering the most in terms of job losses in this COVID side are the millennials and the generation Z's or whatever they call them. And, you know, I look at it and I go, well, those guys don't commit to a job. They will spend two months, two years at a max at a company and then they must go and now get experience somewhere else. And obviously that loyalty, loyalty is being rewarded in, in these times that we live in. And it's kind of shifted the goalpost. So these, you've got a group of young kids that just, you know, the companies are dropping them because they're saying, well, I'm not going to take a chance on you because in two years time, you're going to be gone. Okay. And, you know, one thing I always tell my clients is your biggest cost to company are your salaries. Okay. And your salaries are never going to get less <laughs> unless you get rid of all your staff. They will always go get more and more and more and more. That is what is your biggest cost. Okay. Why don't we look after those assets a lot better than we are? So why isn't occupational health and safety actually being implemented um, as, as just as seriously as your financial audits? Okay, and, and that's kind of where, and the good work that Ken's doing with Intra and what we're doing at Ergomax and all you guys out there, this is the where we're coming from. He's like, these are your assets, let's protect them. So it sounds so complicated in terms of how are we now going to uh, compensate for all of these little idiosyncrasies because I'm just like a safety officer, I'm just an the, the ergonomist. Well, the regulation helps, obviously, in South Africa, and it basically says you need to have a program, all right? And I'm not going to go talk about exactly what it is. I, I think we can maybe have a, a, a seminar later on, on on actually unpacking the regulation if, if that is a need for the for your clients. But at the end of the day, is the, it's a program that must be merged within your existing occupational health and safety system. Okay, so no one with the regulation is saying it's got to be standalone. It's got to be put into what you're currently have in place. And then obviously the backbone of the regulation will be the, um, the risk assessment, right? And that should be done before people even start the jobs. But obviously people are in jobs, so we do it as soon as possible. And um, it's got to be done at intervals not exceeding two years. So quickly, what do we mean by a program? It's a policy that's been put in place that actually just can anticipate if there's going to be risk, identify if there are risks, analyze those risks, and obviously control the ergonomic risks. Uh, it's a standard picture there of any type of um, uh, ergonomics program there. All right. And obviously, you know, at the moment, what I think in, in, when, when ergonomics is in your company is in its infancy, it's a very reactive approach. Ooh, we've got an injury. We better get someone in to come stop the injuries happening. And it should start slowly merging into an advanced program, which is actually quite proactive and actually put structures in place to prevent these injuries from happening. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you now how the injuries come about. And then the risk assessment just means a tool or, or a process on how, how you're going to go about investigating, identifying, analyzing, and, and most importantly, prioritizing that risk. Okay. Um, and there's a whole nitty gritty, but just to, to summarize quite quickly, what do we mean by the ergonomics risk? Well, this is where people get concerned because we think it, it lies in the physical domain. All right. And these are the three key domains in ergonomics. We've got organizational, cognitive, and physical, which I will unpack um, in the next couple of slides. But the red, the, the red words, the ergonomic risk and the arrow, it indicates that your risk can be anywhere on that spectrum. Okay. So in other words, and this is what I try and get across to engineers and, 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 and um, the guys that kind of push back against health and safety and say, it's not just about what you've designed for these people. When you look at the cognitive ergonomics and organizational, it could be management putting too much stress on the people, too many or too much redundant safety checks for a, a client. You know, I was on a mine and they had an emergency tire repair that took six hours because five of those hours they were running around trying to find a safety book and doing a safety audit on what they're going to be doing for the last 20 years of changing the tire. So it came completely redundant. And then the employees get stressed out because it's taken so long to change the tire. And it's just these management systems that are just not actually realistic to what is actually happening on, on, on real world. And it's got nothing to do with engineering. So it could be completely sits over here. Typically it's, it, it's on that spectrum though. All right. 
So when we talk of ergonomics risks, we, we, we're talking, oh, sorry, of organizational risks. It is how you've organized that work, all right? Um, what is the quality management? Can you just go talk to your boss? Is there good teamwork? Are you afraid to go talk to your supervisor? Stuff like that. But it gives us information about how people are behaving in certain environments, how you've structured the work environment, what shift rosters you're using, what management style you're using, whatever the case may be. Okay. And what we found with this just in time, you know, which is fantastic for a financial perspective, but what we find it has started in certain industries to increase ergonomic risk because the employee is feeling rushed. I've only got my five minutes to do my task. And then the next wheel is arriving to put in the car and the car's gone down the line. And it kind of, they sit with that feeling of being rushed. They may not be rushed, but they feel rushed. So it manifests in their body, they, it manifests in their posture, how they hold themselves, and then the resulting um, injuries occur. All right. So that's your organizational domain. Um, and it, it talks to anything. All right. It, it, it's, it, it can come from an office environment to a factory environment to this poor guy that's got to sort out these bolts every morning and he sits on that little whatever that is you know, electrical cord roll for two hours a day. Okay. Okay. Um, and I often see it, like in factories, you know, you ask these guys to sit to do their job and no, no, a plastic chair will be, will, will suffice, you know? And I just think, well, well I'll, I'll sell you a car, but no, no, two wheels will suffice. You can just drag the, the other side of the car along the road with you. All right. So it, it's, it, this is just from my side, if I see something like this, it's not bad health and safety. It's not bad hygiene. It's not bad employee wellness. This is a managerial problem. Someone along the line has decided that this person is not worth their salary and we'll just put them on a plastic chair like that. So I'm being quite flippant, but um, it annoys me. It frustrates me that a guy like this of 22 year olds has to sit stooped over like this and he's going to get quite a bad kafati curve on his back by the time he's 30. And then by the time he's 60, you know, can't enjoy his retirement and can't lift his, his grandchildren because he wasn't provided with the correct environment to work in. Right. So it, it's stuff like that. The cognitive ergonomics, I think people get a bit confused here, but it is simply just how do we process information? How, what is presented to me and how do I interpret that data? Okay. And when I get that data and I'm interpreting it, it's going to create a physical movement. So that's what we talk of that motor function. Right, so it helps us understand how do we do what we're doing. So just to unpack it a bit, it's it's like this: I'm talking to you. There's an input. It's my my voice. All right, you are looking at my picture on the screen, and you are, your eyes are receiving that information, and you are listening. You are processing that. Oh, he's talking rubbish. I'm not going to listen. Oh, my mom's on my phone. I'm texting. You know, none of your cameras are on, so I have no idea who's looking and who's not. But you will make a decision on whether you are going to, that input is relevant to you, all right? You will make a decision. That decision will then create a command effector, which will tell you to do something. Oh, he's boring. I'm going to mute. I'm going to rather look at my phone. What do you do? You look at your phone. There's the action. The output is you've looked at your phone, and that reinforces that what you've done. Okay, until I scream like a banshee and then you quickly stop what you're doing and you quick, quickly look back at the screen. Okay, and then because the input now has alerted you, that scream has shocked you into paying attention. You, your decision is, ooh, he shouted, I better listen. You stop doing what you're doing and then the output, I've got your attention again. So think of just driving a car. How many of these loops are going round and round and round and round and round again? And we actually do it um, you know, it, it comes naturally because we've done it for so long. The problem with, 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 I think, and I, I, I might, I might annoy some of you guys there. I think health and safety as good as it is, is progressing into like a, almost like a heuristic. It's just something that needs to be done before I can do my job. And people are not thinking about health and safety. It's becoming now a, let's say unconscious um, process and safety should never be an unconscious process. It should be a conscious decision to protect themselves. And if you throw in health and safety too much at people, it becomes unfortunately an unconscious uh, um, action. So let's quickly look how we can actually disrupt why, where cognitive risk works in. If you look at Eastern culture versus Western cultures, right? And we come up with a color concept of uh, a concept and then what color do they associate with the concept? So it's quite interesting, all right? The color red 
is associated, the concept hot is associated in Eastern cultures as red and it is in American cultures. 95% of Western cultures associate red with hot and only 31% of the Eastern cultures associate red with hot. Quite interesting, huh? So now we are making a safety sign and we've got a lot of, let's say, um, uh, Chinese um, workers and all our safety signs are for denoting something is hot or in red. You've got a bit of an information problem happening there because they're not actually, you're assuming that they are interpreting the red as hot. Okay, but look at the color. Red could also mean danger, all right? Stop. Only 48 49%, 50% of Eastern cultures associate stop with red, which is quite interesting. And, but yet 100% of the Western cultures associate red as, as stop. So it, 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 it becomes quite interesting when you dissect it. And this is where we say ergonomics can start getting as complicated as possible. Okay, this is not going to be covered in a risk assessment, let's say. But if you are having frequent accidents, and all your stop signs are red, and, all, and you've got a, a population that's predominantly Eastern, well, maybe it's because they're not understanding what the red color means. Okay, but look how, quick, look how simple it can be. Just be honest with yourself. If you were driving and you saw that sign, would you steer to the right and go right, as the words say, or will you follow the arrow left? And I can guarantee you that 99% of us will follow the arrow because that's how we process information. The human mind, you know, you, you do get those disorders where people can't filter information and they go mad, all right? And the, they, your mind creates shortcuts and it will follow us an arrow, a picture faster than it will want to actually read the word. And this will create an accident and then guess what happens? Human error gets blamed, all right? When it actually was the person that designed this, this sign, all right? And then physical ergonomics, I think this is where we all sit and this is where we understand ergonomics. And this is also what, what are we doing in the environment? What tools are we using? What PPE do we have? What equipment do we have? What are the loads we lift in, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously this is where we try and reduce um, the, the injuries because this is where what we, this is the, the evidence that we see with a bad ergonomics program. And that physical environment could be anywhere from an office to the stopes in a mine to construction industry. Um, you know, you name it, it is um, certain industries have obviously different things and certain industries and I always show the mines and the, and the construction have inherent risk that you're not going to iron out all the ergonomic risks. And the health and safety supersedes everything else because there's no point in putting this guy watching what he's lifting with his back if the engineer hasn't signed off this pit as, as safe to enter. Okay, so there are, you know, certain industries, there's a scale, but I'll, I'm going to chat about my pyramid now. So if you look, this is from our construction industry, FEM um, website data, all right? And they put, to, I just went and just said, listen, what are these accidents happening? And I just... Um, I cherry picked what I think are ergonomic related injuries. They may not be ergonomic related, but this is, you know, like a hernia, you know, yes, you, you can lift a hernia from lifting a bag of cement, but you could have got it from a congenital problem. But so this is what they put out there and it doesn't look too bad. All right. But what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to take this average price and I'm going to times it by the number of accidents they've actually had. All right. That figure came up to 39 million rand. Okay, so it's not the, uh, you know, our biggest industry is a dislocation or sprain on average is costing us 23 grand. Well, actually the whole industry as a whole, if you add up all of it together, it was 39 million rand. What about the money spent paying the people salaries that were sitting at home recovering from the injuries, last work days? What's that costing you? What is the cost of your time as an administrator writing up the incident reports? Okay, then training someone or replacing them, or if there's a claim against the company, et cetera, et cetera. And I always say to my clients, you know, and I think I stole this uh, bloodless term injury from Dion uh, Bester at the Masters Builders Association, a health and safety guy in the Western Cape, is what is the profitability of your company or even your productivity, let's say, but we talk, we need to make money, the profitability being undermined by bloodless injuries. Okay. And, and this is what happens. You know, and I say to people, I can break your leg. I will put you in a cast 
six weeks later, that bone will be healed. We can rehab you. And literally within three months of you breaking that bone, four months of you breaking that bone, you will be able to walk again, assuming it was a broken leg. Okay. Now, why is it that we hear, well, I've had my carpal tunnel for two years. I've had my shoulder injury for five years. What is actually going on? Why aren't these injuries healing? And the problem is you've broken your leg, but you've still got to walk on it. So you support it and you hobble along, hobble along, and that will take years and years and years to heal. So we don't actually have the luxury of giving our body a chance to recover from repetitive injuries because initially the pain is not so severe that it stops the action. Okay, but then we abuse it, abuse it, and that's why they classify it as a disease. It occurs over time and your body will adapt to a point and then it's not going to adapt anymore. And then you will have what we call an ergonomic related injury or a musculoskeletal injury. So what I've done is, um, and this is where the Puritan ergonomists um, and the Puritan occupational hygienists all shout at me, but that's fine. This is, how I, this is how I prioritize my clients and I call it my health and safety priority pyramid. All right. So let's, I'll take this little poor guy sitting here holding the target. Okay. Quite a funny picture, but let's just unpack it. Your base of any environment that I go into, you have to have sound health and safety principles in that company, okay? Because if without health and safety, it doesn't matter if you've got a fat employee or a, a, a thin employee. It doesn't matter if there's noise, there's noise or dust, okay? It doesn't matter about ergonomics because ultimately the people are at risk of, of dying from a poor health and a safe environment. So this, in my mind, is the key. All of these things form part of health and safety, obviously, and they all feed back into each other. But this is your base structure. This is, this is the foundation of your house, okay? So in this environment with this little guy, there is no health and safety, okay? All right? An ergonomist has come along and said, oh, he needs a chair. So we've provided him with a little chair. We haven't done the hygiene report yet because we haven't measured the noise, so we haven't given him hearing protection, and none of that is going to stop a bullet going through his, his body, all right? Because the health and safety is so poor. So this is where we start. Then you've got to actually have employees that can cope with that environment. It's all very well we spend thousands and thousands of rands, millions of rands of providing a safe environment, but the employee brings in all the injury and the disease or the risk into the company. Okay, and that's where ergonomics, you know, people that are pushing back against ergonomics, you've got to understand we acknowledge in ergonomics that the risk is aligned with the employee and not what the company is doing. Okay. And that opens up a whole different perspective on how to implement health and safety. So then you've got to look at employee wellness and go, well, do we have able or capable employees? Then we worry about hygiene and then we worry about ergonomics. Okay. So there's no point in paying me to do an assessment here because it's, it's so poor. And that's kind of how I see it in, in my mind. All right. Obviously, we don't need well employees. I don't need to do a hygiene and I don't need ergonomics in my company, but I damn well need to make sure that I'm not killing people at my, at my work site. Okay. So if this is not there, it doesn't matter what we do here. Okay. And I've often gone into companies and said, listen, have you had your hygiene assessment done? No. Well, I can't, you know, I can do your ergonomic risk assessment, but you know, wherever there, I think there's a poor environment, I'm going to recommend you do a hygiene assessment because I can't actually understand what is going on in the human body if we don't know what environment these guys are working in, okay? And, and the same, I think we all train, is if we gone on site and it is such a poor health and safety there, I hope we all have the professionality to say, listen, I actually, I'm not coming on site. It's just too dangerous. You have got no structures in place to protect me, let alone, uh, or your employees, let alone me as a consultant, okay? Um, so what I'm trying to say, oopsie, sorry, skipped, is that when we, the human is a, 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 a small part or the operator is a small part of a whole system at play, okay? And when we have a company that has got a lot of ergonomic related injuries, okay, or absenteeism, we've got to look at what is going on in that system that is causing it. It's not as simple as the person is overweight and they cause their own carpal tunnel. It could be they're overweight and they've caused a carpal tunnel. That would be the lucky one. But it's not as simple as that, okay? We get injured on site or at, during our work activity because of there's this dynamic interplay of, of various things at play. All the different types of work demands, 
the environment we're working in and the human behavior all will lead to an ergonomic related injury. Okay, so it, it, it's not just a simple cause and event or, or, or correlation, should we say. Okay, so the way I have tried to make this ergonomics um, as simple as possible is I've developed what we call the risk tools, the ergokinetic risk, risk tools. Okay, and this is my passion. So I have spent years and years, and I go over the ruler, the Reba, the, the MAC tools, the, the, the ISO standards, the American TLVs. Any company that wants to work with me, they go, listen, can, please, can you use this tool? I'll, I'll use those tools. Obviously, you are free to choose which, any risk tool you want. But I've spent time in packing this all into one type of tool. My biggest issue I have with ergonomics at practitioners, per se, is when I use Ruler, Reba, NIOS, none of those risk tools consider the operator. None of them. Okay? They're not looking at... Is it a fat person, a thin person? Is it a girl? Is it a boy? They're simply saying, based on the data, 10% of the work population can handle this load. Okay? Or this is where your risk lies. How can you say that if you haven't looked at the person doing the job? Okay, so, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. You're saying, great risk tools, perfect, but I want to add in the human variable as well. Because like I have, I have said, the human can be bringing in the injury. All right, so a quick example, you got carpal tunnel syndrome. The first thing I would do is, are you pregnant if you're a woman? All right, no, I'm not pregnant. Okay, cool. Have you just had a baby? No, I haven't. Okay, cool. Have you got high blood pressure? Yes. Aha, let's control your blood pressure and see if the carpal tunnel goes away. Because high blood pressure, because the arteries expand in your wrist, puts pressure on the nerve, causes, uh, causes carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, so that can be completely unrelated to the job, to what they're doing, to anything other than they have high blood pressure. And this is where we say, you know, you are competent, anyone's competent to do a basic risk assessment. When something is going wrong, then let's call in a specialist. Okay. So the, what it looks like, or this is the premise of the formula. What I say is when I tell you that something is ergonomic risk, what I have done as a consultant is I've looked at what we call our core functional capacity, certain basic human factors. Now we can put in your body strength, your age, your weight, your heart, your BMI, your percentage. We can throw in whatever we want. We can keep it as complicated and make it as complicated as you want, or we keep it simple. What is your age? What is your, your biological sex? What is your, um, I can't go into a discussion on, on, on gender identification. So what is your biological sex? What is your age? What is your heart? How long have you been doing the job? And maybe we'll add in some strength profiles in there and that will say right this is the score for your human person then you've got to add that score to what they're actually physically doing in the in the environment all right then we've got to say so what environment are they in then we've got to look at how's that organized shift times how long are they doing it for etc etc we're going to look at the postures that they are forced to um, be in when they do that job and then we've got to add, ask some cognitive stuff say hey what maybe have you had a divorce lately? Have you had a new baby lately? Have you just been married? Has your mom been in a car accident? Heaven forbid, no. All of those things can give us an idea of the, the state of how people are going to be responding to stuff. And we multiply that by duration and then we add it to the human score and we come up with a total risk. That's the whole premise. So very complicated, but the beauty is my system only needs you to measure certain variables, all right? So let's take a lifting example. This is the lifting calculator. What is your age? How long have you been doing the task? What is your body weight? What is your heart? It'll score the BMI. If the BMI goes red, well, I know, okay? They could have a lot of muscles, but they could have a lot of fat, okay? Send them to medical surveillance. That's the nurse's job. That's not my job as an ergonomist. It's flagged, report it, okay? Plug in the task time. That's an automatic calculation. That's an automatic calculation. All right, I'm not going to unpack it too much. How far do they hold the, the load from their body? Where are they lifting the load from? Where are they moving the load to? How often do they move that load? What is their heart rate? What is the weight of the load? Do they hold it statically? Do they twist? Are they handles? Do they work on their knees? Is a lift occurring when they knee, on their knees? And the environment temperature? And it just spits out, yes, and under these conditions, he's lifting it off the, the floor, Compression is not, but nothing else is a problem, so it's a low risk. Okay, so if you look up here, the ergonomic score is a function of those 
human scores, this side, and the task score, this side, and it merges those two and said, right, that's your ergonomic risk. And we've had cases where the human score is so high, and this is green, and it's still a red risk. And that then leads us to control measures. What control measures do we need to do? Well, we, there's nothing we need to do in terms of the environment. We've got to control for our human operator. Okay, what's wrong with our human operator? Well, then that's where you send for medical surveillance and figure out what is going on, and then we can dissect it like that. So as complicated as ergonomics is, we can make it simple. All right. So again, this is just a picture of my office calculator, but to me, what are the practical solutions? Um, we've got that uh, three-day risk auditors course where you get the software. Uh, we can do that physical or online. A brilliant starting point, and I recommend anyone that's done my course, please go and let's do this ergo track um, course because it's a good fundamental course on kind of what do we mean by ergonomics and what are we talking about and how in general processes. Um, and the most practical for me then is obviously just getting the software that works for your company. All right. Um, just so that you guys know, in case there are the questions, the, the ergonomic regulation does not stipulate that you have to use a certain tool. It says the risk assessment you do has to be applicable to your work environment. Okay, so this is where I caution my clients. So you are trained to do the NIOSH lifting equation, all right? And let's say you work for a company that handles cement. That NIOSH equation clearly starts at 23 kilograms. So if you run that on a task that, that is lifting, that starts at 50, well, it's actually a null and void exercise and it's not an appropriate risk tool for the task at hand. Okay, so that's where people get a bit confused as what, what do we need, what tool must we use and where, and that's what obviously we can help you with, um, or even obviously with the, once you've done the ergo track, uh, uh, you'll have a better basic understanding of ergonomics and you can select the correct tool for your, your job. Okay, so um, that's me ending, so I can stop my share. Um, and then Ken, you are the host. So thank you very much. I'm sure there are lots of questions, hopefully, and we can um, chat, ask the questions. Well, Dale, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I uh, just want to confirm that you can hear me again. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. So we've got sound from this side and that's great. When I invited you to uh, participate in this, this um, webinar, I almost imagined that you were going to talk about the fundamentals in terms of lifting and twisting and pushing and pulling and those sorts of things, but you've given us a much better insight, certainly for me, a far better insight into the, so the global issue, the global science of ergonomics. And there are certainly elements which I did not and have not actually taken into account. So I just want to say thank you. It was nice and depth. Really, really appreciate that, Dale. You've done a great job. And by the way, your timing is perfect. I don't know if you can... You can see it. I was just looking at the clock on the wall there. 45 minutes, Dale said. <laughs> so that's absolutely brilliant. I appreciate that hugely. Dale, what I want to do now, uh, before I open the, um, the microphones, I sort of quickly share my screen and go to, uh, there we go. I just want to go to this screen over here because I know that there are a number of people that have come on. I want to say to you, would you please register online? Uh, not Sorry, not online. My apologies. Just register on WhatsApp to tell me that you are here. And if you happen to be a member of SIOSH, you may want to claim the CPD points for this event. So if you wouldn't mind, just take that telephone number, 082-920-8912, 082-920-8912. And while they're doing that, Dale, can you just tell us how do we get hold of you? Because I'm sure many people would like to chat to you. Yeah. So um, my cell phone number is 082-462-5486. I'll just say it again, 082-462-5486. Or um, it's my name, Dale, at ergomax, e -R -G -O -M -A -X, dot co dot z a. Fantastic. And those of you that didn't get that, just uh, drop me a line, send me a WhatsApp message, and I'll share Dale's information mm -hmm. with you. Uh, Dale, you may remember the name Deline Sheesby. She came on your course recently, I think, yeah. within the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I do. Okay. She loved your program. She absolutely raved about it. Um, Deline and I have known each other for 
as many years as, as I've been in health and safety practically. And she was just raving. She was saying that it was really, really good. She gained a lot of information. You say that's a three-day course. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you say it's online or is this a, a classroom-based course, Dale? Uh, well, we've got, a tip, obviously, it's always been uh, classroom-based. And then, obviously, with COVID, we moved it online. So, I've got different options. There are the classroom-based, which... I think a lot of people prefer because it's a lot more interactive and stuff, but we do have online courses and we've also got a correspondence course. So same course, but just done in three different uh, manner ways, so to speak. Okay. Fantastic. Appreciate that. So if anybody wants more information, just send me a WhatsApp message and I'll collect it from there. Now, those of you that know us, we know, you know that we publish a health and safety training material. And mm -hmm. one of the questions that always comes up is where do we get training material so we can run these workshops in the house? Um, well, in this specific instance over here, because of the regulation, it says that employees must be trained. You know that old um, inform, instruct, train and supervise, inform, instruct, train and supervise. And the ergonomics regulation says we must do that as well. So I want to quickly do a, a quick ad. And Dale, I think I'm going to have to change the name of my course. My course and your course are both called Ergotrack. So we'll, we'll rectify that. Um, um, my no, apologies. No, no, no. Uh, Sorry, in, um, in your mind, um, I'm not Ergotrack. I was punting your course, Ergotrack. You were? Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we are the Ergonomic Risk Auditors course, the Iraq course. Iraq. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And those of you that um, already have this Ergotrack uh, training material, you'll see that you've got the last portion. You've got the Ergo Rex, which are facilitator guides, uh, facilitator visuals, the government gazettes and explanatory notes, and that's it. And I think, Dale, you mentioned that you, you wouldn't mind coming on and actually talking about the regulations at some stage? Um, you, know, uh, you know, ergonomics is so complex. I'm quite happy to do a uh, bar monthly, every three months talk on a different aspect of ergonomics. I mean, you can see how complicated it is. But I think, you know, a lot of people are concerned, you know, the regulation is the most relevant and pertinent. Um, so I'm happy whenever you are um, ready or you've got clients wanting it, I'm happy to do it. Yeah. Okay. So to those of you that are participating, I see we've got 30 people that are still participating. Thank you so much. You can just send me a message saying I'd like Dale to talk to us about the ergonomics regulation. And I know that they promulgated it in, back in early in uh, December, and then they changed one or two sections uh, specifically related to the training uh, the competency of the ergonomic risk assessor. So maybe we can catch up on that. But the ergo track, the training material that we've got, is not credit bearing. And the reason for that is that there's no specific unit standard for this general, the fundamentals of um, ergonomics. Um, we, we may see something in the new year, but at this stage, it's going to be a legal compliance training program, which you, once you're orientated, will be able to use it. And I'll just mention this as well. What we're going to do, as we've done in the past, like we did with COVID-19, is that if you do acquire the training material, we will actually spend an hour or two unpacking it. We'll record it so that you can use it and that you're a little more familiar with that. Okay, so we've done the registration. You know about claiming your CPD points. And what I want to do at this stage is I'm going to end the recording, but we're going to continue with question time. So I'd like to say to every single person that's participated in the program up to now, thank you very, very much. Thank you for participating. It, it keeps us busy. It, uh, it has been one of the most enjoyable periods. Can you believe COVID-19 has kept us busy like you cannot believe? I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. I've learned from people like Dale. I've learned from Wayne. I've learned from Rinus, our psychologist. I learned from the guys that both um, books von Heerden, who had COVID and Trevlin Powell tomorrow, I think is her surname. She had COVID. We've learned from as many people as possible because we don't know it all. And I think that Dale made a very good point there. He says that this occupational health and safety, the safety side, we're pretty much au fait with. But it's the occupational health and the occupational hygiene that's a science. And I think you made that point very clearly that, um, and, and just in terms of your explanation, there is a heck of a lot more to the subject of ergonomics than I even began to, 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 to conceptualize. So Dale, once again, I want to say thank you to you. Um, I've never heard of the term bloodless injuries. That was a new one for me. Thanks so much. That was, a, that was an in interesting one because I've often regarded as those injuries that you can see and those injuries that you can't. But um, having said that, I want to say thank you. So I want to mention to all the people that are watching and maybe watching the YouTube video clip at a later stage, I'd like to ask you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And what it will automatically do is notify you when there's a new video that comes out or a new speaker or such like.
We've got a website that we've been working on and we'll have all of our YouTube videos on that shortly. The website's about 95% complete, so we're really chuffed about that. And then, of course, those of you that do not know about the South African Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, SIOSH, we'd like to invite you to join SIOSH as a member. They provided us with CPD points, um, Continual Professional Development points for this program and all our other webinars in future. So a little bit of an ad for SIOSH. Um, you can go on to www.siosh.co.za to get hold of Dale. It's www.ergomax.co.za. And of course, you got his telephone number as he read it out to you. And with that, I'm going to stop the recording and I'm going to say to, to the participants that have been here, thank you so much. Our next webinar will be in two weeks' time and we're hoping to have the topic environmental issues so that we can address the she or the e in she. And with that, from Penny and myself here in Mauritius, we want to say thank you so much. Uh, don't go away. We'll take questions after this. Bye for now.